college students. No doubt you're asking yourself, Dr. Shell, why are you dressed up like some sort of film noir gumshoe detective? The reason is we're going to be talking about a kind of logic that is called abductive logic. So deductive logic is the kind of logic like mathematics, that if your premises are true, your conclusion is absolutely certain, and it's very rigid in the way that you formulate it. Inductive logic is the gathering of data and facts that form the premise that then lead to a conclusion that is probable. Abductive logic is the reverse. In abductive logic, you're going to start with a situation, a premise, a reality. And then you're going to attempt to work backwards to the most reasonable solution. So this is what detectives do. This is what doctors do. This is what auto mechanics do. You present them a situation. My car won't start. And so there are a variety of reasons that your car won't start. And what they'll start doing is gathering data. Did it start yesterday? Have you noticed any unusual noises? Uh, did, was it slow to start the other day? Um, so then you begin to work backwards and say, what are the uh, probable explanations for this situation as we have it? When you, or if you were to come home and there would be a crime scene, your front door is busted open and your appliances and jewelry are missing. Um, and there are some footprints uh, in, the, uh, in the carpet. Um, and so detectives would come and do their analysis. And so they would begin to work backwards to say, given this situation, what is the most likely situation, the most likely scenario. Now, uh, this brings us to uh, Sherlock Holmes, probably one of the great uh, literary characters of all time and certainly one of the greatest detective. Now, uh, what's interesting is Sherlock Holmes uh, was this brilliant detective who worked uh, uh, separate of the police department. He, had, he was a consulting detective, he called himself, and uh, he had a sidekick whose name was uh, Mr. Watson, Dr. Watson, who was a, a medical doctor. Now, it's interesting that Sherlock Holmes was written by a man named Sir Arthur Cannon Doyle, and Sir Arthur Cannon Doyle was, in fact, a medical doctor. And he based the character of Holmes on a brilliant philo uh, uh, professor he had in medical school. So the character of Sherlock Holmes, written by a doctor, was based on a, a professor in uh, medical school. And coming forward, the TV series House MD is based on the character of Holmes. Get it? Holmes, House. And House has a sidekick whose name is Wilson. Not Will Watson, but Wilson. And so it is a, an homage to the character of Sherlock Holmes, who was in fact himself an homage to this brilliant uh, medical uh, professor that uh, Sir Arthur Cannon Doyle had. The character of Sherlock Holmes is working on abductive logic. He's looking at the situation as it is, the evidence at hand, of course, what it is, is he notices things that other people don't notice. He has a deeper uh, wealth of information, knowledge, than other people have. So he's able to bring both deductive and inductive skills to the task of saying, given what I see in front of me, what is the most likely explanation? We, we try to reason to the most uh, uh, reasonable explanation for what we see. In uh, one of his stories called uh, the, uh, the Sign of the Four, Holmes is talking to Watson and trying to explain to him his method. And he says this to him, when you have le eliminated the impossible, whatever remains 
however improbable, must be true. So Holmes says, we set about to eliminate anything that's impossible, right? If a crime was committed and somebody can show evidence that they were uh, in, in Colombia or they were in uh, the beach in Panama, then they couldn't have been here to do it. Now, it doesn't mean they weren't involved, but they couldn't have physically done it if they physically weren't here. That's impossible. So you then begin to work backwards, eliminating impossibilities. And then Holmes' idea is whatever you're left with, however improbable it is, that is the truth. And so we're going to be looking in this unit on uh, abductive logic. And I keep them straight because if you think about it like an abduction, so if, if somebody was abducted, you would take that fact, look at the evidence, and then work backwards. Now notice you will use inductive and deductive reasoning to try to explain the reality as it exists. And the best explanation will be the one that explains, takes into account the greatest number of facts and therefore will be the most probable. This is all gonna come out to a question of probability. Now, I wanna throw this out there because Probably you had a school-age friend who was one of those annoying people that whenever you said something like, gosh, I wonder why, uh, you know, the, my teacher is late for class, and then he'll be like, well, you know, maybe she got attacked by aliens, and you'll be like, that, that it, she wasn't attacked by aliens, and he'll say, well, it's possible, it's possible, right? Remember, this is an infinite universe. Anything is possible. But when we try to use our power of reason, we are trying to say, okay, among the infinite possibilities, what are the most probable explanations? And that's the one that we want to land on, to eliminate the impossible and then limit the possible down to the probable. And that's where we're going to land. So, happy sleuthing. This is Dr. Shell sauntering on. Okay, so as I indicated that uh, abductive logic is the way in which uh, crime investigators, detectives, uh, and medical researchers and doctors um, operate. Um, what happens is you're presented with an actual conclusion. So I set this crime scene up uh, for a middle school class that I teach on logic. And um, so this is what you're presented. There's a, a body of a teenage boy that's found in a a classroom uh, first thing in the morning when the janitor comes in and this is what you're presented with and so you work backwards from what you see to use inductive and deductive logic to try to decide what is the most likely situation here um, is it possible that this was a mafia hit and that this body was dumped here well sure but before you really work that Avenue you need to ask yourself is there any evidence that the mafia involvement? Does it have any of the hallmarks of uh, gang uh, violence? And so uh, re uh, investigators start with the conclusion and they then work backward to try to find the explanation uh, that is the best given the scenario that you have in front of you. And the textbook that I often use by Louis Vaughn, he has very nice set up sort of a two-step process for analyzing uh, hypotheses that are suggested and then testing them to see uh, which is the most likely. So uh, Dr. Louis Vaughn in several of his um, textbooks and writings uses this uh, acronym of SEARCH when looking to try to find the truth in an abductive way or working to try to analyze a hypothesis that's being presented. So he says, first of all, you have to state the claim. Remember going back to the very beginning of our investigation into logic that we first of all wanted them to have TLC. First of all, we want them to be uh, clear, um, logical, true, and clear. So the first thing you want to do before you really invest a lot of energy into the search for truth, make sure you understand clearly what is being claimed. And then you begin to search for evidence that explains um, the 
claim, it explains the hypothesis, it explains the situation. So you examine um, all the evidence that's available. Um, this is the hard work of logic um, before we uh, can really come down to a uh, conclusion. We have to really analyze all the evidence that's available and then we um, propose a variety of hypotheses. What are the uh, probable um, hypothesis that it would explain the situation in front of us. Now, remember, don't get hung up on possible. Everything is po anything is possible. So if you write down the possible scenarios, you would never finish writing your hypotheses. But um, writing down the things that are the most probable uh, based on what's in front of you. And then, here's the part, and he put this is all together. You rate by the criteria all the hypothesis. Rate by a criteria all the hypothesis. That is you set up some standard that you're then going to weigh all the hypothesis against and to decide which hypothesis is the strongest. Remember this will not give us absolute certainty. Uh, this sort of logic is um, always sort of hit and miss uh, thinking about going to the auto mechanic and you come in and your car is making a noise and so the mechanic will say what are the probable explanations for that noise um, but it's never absolutely certain and so usually what happens is they do a diagnostic and then they replace a part and the noise is still there okay it wasn't that let's try something else and of course this gets very frustrating and can be very expensive but this is the way that you work from abduction um, you started with the conclusion and you're working backwards trying to find the inference to the best explanation so that you can act on it. But the key thing that uh, Vaughn works here is that once you have uh, assembled a, a range of hypotheses, and it might be two, it might be 50, you know, why is my child acting that way? Uh, why won't my team at work? Uh, be productive. Um, so you have in front of you the situation, right? Uh, the lack of productivity of your team at work. Now you're going to work backwards. What are the possible explanations for why they're not being productive? What evidence do you have that would suggest a hypothesis that you can then work from? And then arrange those uh, hypotheses in uh, order by a criteria that you set up. What explains the behavior of this team in this situation? Now, what he does then is he gives us a criteria of adequacy. Um, so the idea is, if a hypothesis, is it all adequate? It's got to measure up on this scale. And then once you take the various uh, hypothesis in front of you, and you measure them against this scale, the one that has the highest ranking is the one that's the most probable and the one that you ought to explore most diligently. doesn't mean it's right. Um, and so uh, we begin by starting with a uh, criteria of adequacy. And so uh, one of the things that he, he says is, first of all, if somebody has a hypothesis, an explanation, remember we're looking for an inference to the best explanation, if the explanation isn't testable, then you have to throw it out because it can't be adequate because there's no way to know if it's right. Um, it, he gives the idea of a, um, like if somebody told you that electric lights work because there's little gremlins inside the electric uh, tube, the electric light bulb, and they're using these little uh, hammers to strike the glass and it causes a spark. Now. You say, well, that's a ridiculous hypothesis. Okay, well, let's roll with it. Well, the first thing you say is, okay, well, let's break a light bulb open and we'll see if there's any gremlins inside. And then they say, oh, they're invisible gremlins. Okay, so now you've brought out the idea of an inv invisible gremlins. So you say, okay, well, we'll listen really closely to see if we can hear their little hammers striking the glass. You say, oh, they don't make any sound. Okay, well, now what you've done is you've created a, an explanation that's not testable. 
And so we have to throw that out because um, there's no way for us to evaluate it. There's no way to know. Um, as I'm recording this, we are uh, over a year into the COVID pandemic and our scientists have been working away at trying to find treatments and trying to find um, vaccines that will be effective. And this is exactly how somebody comes up with an idea and say, okay, we're going to test it. We're going to try this model and see, does it work in the laboratory? Does it work in uh, animals? Does it work in test subjects? Um, but there has to be a way that you can test it to even bother with the hypothesis. So the next thing he does is say that, okay, not only does it have to be uh, testable, but it has to be simple. He uses the test of simplicity. Now, this is awesome, often called Occam's razor. Now, it doesn't mean that the simplest solution is always right, but it's certainly the place you ought to start. Now, he doesn't mean simple that every problem has a simple solution. It could be very complicated. I mean, if you're trying to put a rover on, the, on Mars, that's not a simple proposition. And if the question is, how can we fly a helicopter on Mars? The solution is not going to be simple. What he means here, and what Occam is famous for saying, is that you can't propose a solution that is more complicated than the problem was when we started. So that the solution that is simplest in the terms that it makes the least demands of uh, more uh, problems than it solves. So let's go back to our, our thing about gremlins. So you're thinking to yourself, and I stole this from Lewis, by the way. So, you know, you're um, thinking, I don't know how electric lights work. I, I really don't know. Okay, so let's say you think, well, I just like to, I'd like to know. So you come up with the gremlin theory. Okay, now, I started by not understanding how electric lights work. And now your solution introduced invisible gremlins. So now I have two problems, not one. And and the other one is not testable. Okay, so uh, again, going back to the crime scene that I created for those middle schoolers. Uh, middle schoolers are amazing at their capacity to come up with crazy and ridiculous uh, solutions. And so, yeah, so we, you know, the idea was there was this teenage boy is found uh, in the classroom. Uh, he's got a gash in his head. There's blood on the floor. Um, and they're like, oh, it was a, it was a gang, it was a gang hit, you know. Well, we have no evidence for a gang hit, so your that solution is not simple because it introduced more complexity into the problem. As we began to unpack the evidence, we found in that backpack that the student had received a rejection letter from the school, and it was all crumpled up in his backpack and. Uh, there was, you see, there was paint cans all over the crime scene, and he had spray painted on the chalkboard, "This school sucks." Um, and there was a uh, stool there, a step stool that he was using to do his graffiti, and the step stool is falling over sideways. Um, so then we began to look at the evidence that's presented, and we had no evidence that there was anybody else at the scene. Uh, there's no uh, fingerprints, there's no uh, DNA evidence, uh, there's nothing to suggest that there was anybody there but that student. And so we began to hone down the possibilities based on the data that was in front of us and looking for the solution that was the simplest that answered um, the evidence at hand without trying to introduce any new complexities into the equation. Okay, the next thing is that uh, Vaughn points out that the uh, solution ought to be um, fruitful. And he also talks about uh, scope. And what he means by that is that if you come up with an explanation for something and it only explains this one particular scenario, then it's not a very fruitful explanation. And its, its scope is very narrow. Good solutions and to hypothesis and good explanations 
would explain not only this situation, but would have application to others. And at their core, they would be really good if they could actually predict future situations. So you're analyzing your crew at work and you think, gosh, why are we just not being very productive? And you come up with a range of hypotheses, right? And one of those hypothesis that comes up is that, uh, you know, we've been working really hard on this project and, and no one's really been given any um, positive feedback on how hard they have been working, how much they have achieved. And so you decide, you know, what we ought to do is, um, you know, we ought to just have a, a little a party, put some food in the break room and let people know, hey, I appreciate all the hard work you're doing. And, uh, looking forward to you know getting this project wrapped up and, and put to bed um, now you say well you know uh, that's that's worked in the past and uh, with other groups that I've worked on and uh, you know if this solution works and you think you know what it might have application to others and so if your explanation for the poor performance is a lack of feedback and lack of positive reinforcement um, then that has a scope that is beyond um, this one particular thing and it might have uh, a wider uh, fruitfulness beyond this particular situation. Uh, now, again, you'd want some evidence, right? You want to be able to say, well, in fact, you know, it's been a long time since we've had any sort of employee recognition. Uh, you're going to base this on the evidence and what your other theories are, right? I mean, it could be your competitor is slipping something into the uh, into the coffee maker to make everybody lethargic. Um, again, do you have any evidence for that? That's not a simple solution. You've just introduced more complexity. Is it testable? Um, but maybe that would be. And then the last thing uh, that Vaughn points out here is um, that hypothesis and their solutions and inferences to the best explanation are generally uh, conservative. Now, what he means by that has nothing to do with political conservatism. And it means that um, when you propose a solution, um, it ought to be based on established science and what is already known in this field. So that if it relies on exotic um, inferences and if it, it requires a huge stretch of already established knowledge and precedents, you might be able to put that one on the back burner. Uh, and if your other hypotheses, which have a stronger case, um, are weak, then you might come back and visit that one. This is sometimes called a, a paradigm shift. Um, so that, you know, when, when Newton proposed his laws of gravitation, um, it required a, some pretty heavy intellectual uh, buy-in and it, it stretched the existing knowledge and Einstein's theory of general relativity required a huge uh, paradigm shift in the way people thought these were huge revolutionary um, ideas um, but notice they don't come along very often um, those are two instances maybe you could talk about the uh, Copernican revolution where understanding that the Earth is no longer the center of the universe is another big example of a paradigm shift. But these don't come along very often. Most of the time, when we're looking for the uh, inference to the best explanation, it's going to fit inside the what we already know about science and nature of reality and a past experience. So that it's best to sort of start with what has worked and what is known and established and introduce novelty um, only to the extent that it's necessary to sort of fit this particular scenario. And it almost is a variation on Occam's razor, right? But it, it, it's just not asking us to uh, stretch beyond um, the bounds of, of uh, accepted knowledge. Okay, so let's return to the crime scene here for a few moments. Um, as I said, we found in the backpack this letter of rejection that was dated just a few days before this break-in. There was a window that was found to have been uh, broken so that the student gained entrance into this particular classroom. Um, in the backpack was also a fast food bag from McDonald's and it had a receipt in it. Um, that receipt um, had a timestamp. So we knew 
from the timestamp that um, the student had gone to the McDonald's um, at 9.30 in the evening. Okay, so that means he couldn't have been in this room earlier than 9.30 because he had a receipt uh, from 9.30. So that is a deductive argument. That is, it's impossible to be somewhere uh, and somewhere else at the same time. Uh, so that was a use of deductive logic. Inductive logic um, demonstrated that there were no um, fingerprints other than his own at the website, at the, at the site of the crime scene. Um, the blood evidence uh, shows a blunt force trauma. Uh, so it's not consistent with a gunshot. It's not consistent with a stabbing. Uh, it looked like the student fell off that ladder, whacked his head against this, the uh, block of the window frame, and was rendered unconscious and then died of a internal hemorrhaging in his brain. Uh, we had a, a confirmation of the um, pathology to analyze that and from the coroner's office. Now, that's based on inductive logic. Okay, that is um, over years and years and years of research. Um, blood splatter looks a certain way when it's blood fort trauma versus whether it's um, uh, severed an artery. Um, and blood uh, damage to the brain that causes swelling that eventually ends in death is something that has been observed over a long time period of time over a consistent study. That's the standard in the industry. Now we go back to thinking about those four criteria of adequacy. And so this is not, this is a conservative observation. We don't have to introduce any novel uh, theory or uh, beliefs about the world. This is very consistent with what is already known inside the, the medicine and inside forensic science. Um, and so what we then discovered by looking at videotape evidence from the uh, hallway, because this student came in through the window, so we don't have the, the victim on film, but we do have a teacher that came into the building um, late that evening, about 10 o'clock, because she needed to um, retrieve something from her classroom that she had forgotten. And we see her um, walk down the hall, and um, it's believed that that's about the time of death. Notice that's based on in, uh, uh, inductive logic, that time of death based on the, the forensics of the body. But the deductive part of this is we do have evidence and timestamp that shows her in the building at about that same time. And so the uh, inference that we make is that her presence in the building startled the student. The student then fell, and that resulted in death. So this is um, a, an accident. Um, it was a crime in progress, um, but his death was accidental because of being startled uh, while in the act of vandalizing the school. And so this is sort of how we illustrated um, inductive logic. Okay, again, it's not high drama as Sherlock Holmes, but it's the best we could do. Um, so as you're looking at um, the world and thinking abductively, it's a way in which we, we have to function a lot because we are given a scenario of the reality of the world and we're trying to figure out why is it like that. And using these steps, using his search method and then testing it by a criteria of adequacy will help us not fall into ridiculous uh, conspiracy theories and just just idiocies that are out there. Um, the, uh, the famous Pizzagate scenario where this guy somehow came to believe that um, Hillary Clinton and some bunch of Democrats were running a sex ring out of a pizza shop in D.C. Um, and he literally, this guy was from one of the Carolinas and gets some weapons and he drives all the way to D.C. and he gets into this pizza shop and starts shooting because he is absolutely convinced that there is a child sex ring running out of this pizza shop. And if he had approached this with our search method, if he had tested it against an adequacy, he would have realized that this is so unlikely. It's not even on the... Now, there certainly are children's sex slaves in the world, um, but he needed to 
check his emotions and use some standard in order to establish uh, what in fact is the case. So this is our discussion of abductive logic. Thank you for your time. Dr. Shell, sauntering on.